tonight's lecture concerns the cardiovascular system and specifically the blood. And this is chapter 19 in your textbook, beginning on page 696. So the circulatory system. The circulatory system, also called the cardiovascular system or the vascular system, is an organ system that permits blood to circulate and transport nutrients such as amino acids and electrolytes, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hormones, and blood cells to and from the cells in the body to provide nourishment and help in fighting diseases, stabilize temperature and pH, and also maintain homeostasis. The circulatory system is a body-wide network of blood, blood vessels, and lymph. Powered by the heart, it is the body's distribution system to organs with oxygen, hormones, and essential nutrients that helps it to function properly. And the study of blood flow is called hemodynamics. So there's more, excuse me, there's four major components of the circulatory system. The first one is the heart, and it's about the size of two adult hands held together. The heart rests near the center of the chest. Thanks to consistent pumping, the heart keeps the circulatory system working at all times. Arteries. Arteries carry oxygen-rich blood away from the heart and where it needs to go. On the other hand, veins, they carry deoxygenated blood to the lungs where it can receive oxygen. And finally, blood. Well, blood is the transport media of nearly everything within the body. As I said on the previous slide, it transports hormones, nutrients, oxygen, antibodies, and other important things to help keep the body healthy. So the blood is a liquid connective tissue that consists of cells surrounded by a liquid extracellular matrix. So, blood is a bodily fluid that delivers necessary substances such as nutrients and oxygen to the cells and transports metabolic waste products away from those same cells. When it reaches the lungs, gas exchange occurs when carbon dioxide is diffused out of the blood into the pulmonary alveoli and oxygen is diffused into the blood. Blood contains antibodies, nutrients, oxygen, and much more to help the body work. So the functions of the blood uh, can be found on page 697, but we'll go through this PowerPoint slide quickly. Well, first of all, it supplies oxygen to tissues. Uh, so it bounds, it's bound to hemoglobin, which is carried in the red blood cells. Uh, secondly, it supplies nutrients such as glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids. And these are dissolved in the blood or bound to plasma proteins. The blood removes wastes such as carbon dioxide, urea, and lactic acid. The blood also provides some immunological functions, including circulation of white blood cells and the detection of foreign material by antibodies. So in response to a broken blood vessel, the blood coagulates. This is the conversion of blood from a liquid to a semi-solid gel to stop bleeding. And I know we've talked about that in a previous chapter. Uh, messenger functions, including the transport of hormones and the signaling of tissue damage. It also helps to regulate the body pH, and it helps to regulate the core body temperature. So what's inside of the blood? Well, the blood accounts for 7% of the human body weight. The average adult has a blood volume of roughly 5 liters, and this is composed of plasma and several kinds of cells. These blood cells, which are also called corpuscles or formed elements, consist of erythrocytes or red blood cells, or we can call them RBCs, leukocytes, also known as white blood cells, and thrombocytes, or what we call platelets. By volume, the red blood cells constitute about 45% of the whole blood, and the plasma equates to about 54.3% of it. So this is figure 19.1 on page 699. So we can see that 
the blood is a liquid connective tissue and it consists of cells surrounded by a liquid matrix and we call that matrix plasma. So if we look at this cartoon here, we see that the blood plasma makes up about 55% and the red blood cells make up about 45%. And I know those numbers are slightly different than what we had mentioned on the previous slide, but they're close. And then uh, the rest of that blood is what we call a buffy coat, and that's composed of the white blood cells and the platelets. So this cartoon is also the appearance of centrifuged blood. So if you've ever worked with a centrifuge before, uh, what you do is it's kind of a round-shaped device, and you put um, tubes or vials, and it'll have pock or yeah, uh, pockets for vials or tubes, and you put those in there. You turn it on, and it spins really fast. And gravity will pull uh, the heavier objects down uh, towards the bottom of the tube, and then the lighter objects will separate and uh, move closer to the top of the tube. And that's what we see happened here. So we've centrifuged this blood, and then we see those three components of the blood and their concentration So the cellular components or formed elements of blood include red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. The plasma portion of the blood consists of water, proteins, and other solutes. Blood plasma is the pale yellow liquid component of blood that normally holds the blood cells and whole blood in suspension. This makes plasma the extracellular matrix of the blood. Hmm. Good quiz or exam question, huh? Blood plasma is prepared by spinning a tube of fresh blood containing an anticoagulant in a centrifuge until the blood cells fall to the bottom of the tube. The blood plasma is then poured or drawn off. It makes up about 55% of the body's total blood volume. So as I've already said about three or four times now, about 55% of the blood is plasma. Uh, it's a fluid that is the blood's liquid medium, which by itself is straw yellow in color. It is essentially an aqueous solution containing 92% water, 8% blood plasma proteins, and trace amounts of other materials. The plasma circulates dissolved nutrients such as glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, dissolved in the blood or bound to plasma proteins, and removes waste products such as carbon dioxide, urea, and lactic acid. So here's some other important components of blood that you should become familiar with, and that's the serum albumin, the blood clotting factors, and this is to facilitate coagulation. We mentioned that a couple slides ago. Immunoglobulins or antibodies, lipoprotein particles, various other proteins, and various electrolytes, mainly sodium and chloride. So this is table 19.1, and it appears on page 700. Uh, this uh, outlines the substances in the blood plasma, which we've been talking about for the last few slides. But I'd like for you to go through this on your own time and study it, as I usually do with the tables, and just keep in mind that I do tend to pull quiz and exam questions from tables, so these are really good uh, pieces of literature for you to study. So this cartoon is uh, going back to page 699, and once again we're at uh, figure 19.1. So it starts by comparing the whole blood and its amount of body weight that it makes up in contrast to other fluids and tissues. So you can see that the blood is about 8% of your total body weight. Then you notice that we can take this whole blood and we can break it down into plasma and the formed elements. And respectively, that's making up about 55% and 45% of the total blood volume. And if we trace the blood plasma part of this diagram, we see that we can further break the plasma down into about 7% protein and 92, well, 91.5% water and about 1.5% of other solutes. And that's 
the, that percentage makes up the weight of the blood plasma. And staying along with the plasma side of this diagram, uh, we can see that when we look at the proteins, then we can break those proteins down into about 54% albumins, 38% globulins, 7% fibrogens, and then other miscellaneous things make up the remaining 1% of the protein end of it. And water is just water, so we don't break down water into further detail. But the other solutes that we were talking about on the plasma end of the blood are electrolytes, nutrients, gases, regulatory substances, and waste products. And now let's go down to the bottom of the diagram and check out the formed elements. So we see, as we already mentioned, by volume, they make up about 45% of the blood. And we'll start with the platelets. So according to this diagram, there's between 150,000 to 200, excuse me, 150,000 to 400,000 platelets uh, per microliter of blood. And then in the same volume of blood, we're looking at about 5,000 to 10,000 white blood cells. And in that same volume of blood, we're looking at 4.8 to 5.4 million red blood cells. So we can further break down the white blood cells into neutrophils, and we can see that the neutrophils are going to make up about 60 to 70 percent of the white blood cells, and then the lymphocytes, 20 to 25 percent, the monocytes, 3 to 8 percent, the eosinophils, which make up 2 to 4 percent, and the basophils, which make up about a half to 1 percent of the amount of white blood cells in the whole blood. And this diagram here is on page 700, figure 19.2. But we see a scanning electron micrograph image of a white blood cell, a platelet, and a red blood cell. And then in the lower right-hand corner there, we're looking at a light micrograph where we see the white blood cell, the blood plasma, the red blood cell, platelet, and another white blood cell. Let's talk about the formation of blood cells. Lymphocytes are able to live for years while most other blood cells live for hours, days, or weeks. So that seems like a good quiz or exam question. Lymphocytes are long-lived and other blood cells are more shortly lived. The number of red blood cells and platelets remains rather steady while that of white blood cells varies depending on invading pathogens and other foreign antigens. The process of producing new blood cells is called hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. And the pluripotent stem cells differentiate into each of the different types of blood cells. So here we have page 702, figure 19.3. And this kind of gives you a little map of the formation of blood cells. So... You can see there at the top, we've got this pluripotent stem cell. We mentioned that on the previous slide. And then that's going to differentiate into these various other types of cells, uh, the myeloid stem cell or the lymphoid stem cell. And then you see that the myeloid stem cell side of the diagram is going to give rise to the red blood cells, the platelets, the mast cell, the eosinophil, the basophil, the neutrophil, and the monocyte, which looks like that turns into a macrophage. And then on the lymphoid side of it, we see that the stem cell will differentiate into the T lymphocytes, the B lymphocytes, and the natural killer cells. And then the B lymphocytes can further differentiate into a plasma cell. So red blood cells, and this is page 703, are also called erythrocytes, and they are the most common type of blood cell and the vertebrate organism's principal means of delivering oxygen to the body tissues. So when I say vertebrate organisms, I'm talking about dogs and cats and bears and tigers and lions, etc. 
um, and uh, we deliver the we we the vertebrates we deliver the oxygen to the body tissues via blood flow through the circulatory system and the oxygen attaches to the red blood cells the red and I, so I just said the red blood cells take up oxygen in the lungs and release it into the tissues while squeezing through the body's capillaries Furthermore, the erythrocytes contain the protein hemoglobin, and that is used to carry oxygen to all cells and to carry 23% of the total carbon dioxide to the lungs. Each hemoglobin molecule contains an iron ion, which allows each molecule to bind to four oxygen molecules. Red blood cells have no nucleus or other organelles and are bioconcave discs. The lack of a nucleus and the shape allows the cells to efficiently carry oxygen. So if we look on page 704, we see figure 19.4. And we're seeing a red blood cell there on the left. And it looks like it's about 8 micrometers in diameter. And then we see a section view of it. So it's kind of got that a figure 8 look to it. It's not a figure 8, but it does kind of look like a figure 8. And then the iron pro portion of the heme group binds to the oxygen for transport by hemoglobin. And then we see a hemoglobin molecule there in the center. And we see the four heme, or the iron, uh, located within this protein. And that's what, where the oxygen is going to bind to the hemoglobin. And then on the right of this diagram... We just see an iron-containing heme. So that's basically one of those little discs there that's pointed out in the hemoglobin molecule, just magnified, and how it looks chemically. So moving on to the next slide. Hemoglobin is also involved in regulating blood flow and blood pressure via the release of nitric oxide, which causes vasodilation, and that improves the blood flow and enhances oxygen delivery. Red blood cells also contain carbonic anhydrase, which catalyzes the conversion of carbon dioxide and water to carbonic acid. This compound transports about 70% of carbon dioxide in the plasma. It is also a buffer. In humans, mature red blood cells are flexible in oval bioconcave discs. They lack a cell nucleus in most organelles in order to accommodate the maximum space for hemoglobin. They can be viewed as sacs of hemoglobin with a plasma membrane as a sac. Approximately 2.4 million new erythrocytes are produced per second in the human adult. The cells develop in the bone marrow and circulate for about 100 to 120 days in the body before their components are recycled by macrophages. Each circulation takes about 20 seconds. Approximately a quarter of the cells in the human body are red blood cells. Nearly half of the blood's volume, 40 to 45%, is red blood cells. Red blood cells can only live for about 120 days. The dead red blood cells are removed from the circulation by the spleen and the liver. And the breakdown products from the cells are recycled and reused. So this is page 705, figure 19.5. And what this is showing us is that the rate of the red blood cell formation by the red bone marrow equals the rate of red blood cell destruction by macrophages. So let's look at what's happening in this diagram. At number one, the macrophages in the spleen, liver, or red bone marrow phagocytize ruptured and worn out red blood cells. At step two, the globin and heme portions of hemoglobin are split apart. At step, th step three, the globin is broken down into amino acids, which can be reused to synthesize other proteins. Step four, the iron is removed from the heme portion in the form of an iron ion, which associates with the plasma protein transferrin, a transporter for the iron ion in the bloodstream. Five, in the muscle fibers, liver cells, and macrophages of the spleen and liver, the iron ion detaches from the transferrin and attaches to an iron storage protein called ferritin. 
Number six, on release from a storage site or absorption from the digestive canal, iron ion reattaches to the transferrin. Then at step seven, the iron ion transferrin complex is then carried to the red bone marrow where the red bone Red blood cell precursor takes it up through the receptor-mediated endocytosis for use in hemoglobin synthesis. Iron is needed for the heme portion of the hemoglobin molecule, and amino acids are for the globin portion of it. Vitamin B12 is also needed for the synthesis of hemoglobin. At step 8, the erythropoiesis in the red blood marrow results in the production of red blood cells, which enter the circulation. Then at step nine, when iron is removed from the heme, the non-iron portion of heme is converted into biliverdin, a green pigment, and then into bilirubin, a yellow-orange pigment. At step 10, the bilirubin enters the blood and is transported to the liver. Step 11, within the liver, bilirubin is released by the liver cells into the bile, which passes into the small intestine and then into the large intestine. At step 12, in the large intestine, bacteria convert the bilirubin into urobilogen. Then at 13, some urobilogen is absorbed back into the blood, converted to a yellow pigment called urobilin, and that is excreted into the urine. And at step 14, most urobilinogen is eliminated in feces in the form of brown pigment called sterocoblin, which gives feces its characteristic color. So here's a little red blood cell vocabulary for you. The erythropoiesis is the production of the red blood cells, and this begins in the red bone marrow. For the reticular, reticulocytes, which is immature red blood cells, they enter the circulation and mature in one to two days. And erythropoietin, that's a hormone released by the kidneys in response to hypoxia, and hypoxia is just a lowered oxygen condition, and that stimulates the differentiation of homeopoietic stem cells into erythrocytes. And this is figure 19.6 on page 706, and we can see a negative feedback loop. The main stimulus for erythropoiesis is hypoxia. And remember, hypoxia is just an oxygen deficiency condition at the tissue level. You can review the steps to this negative feedback loop on your own time. So moving on to white blood cells. Unlike red blood cells, white blood cells, also known as leukocytes, contain a nucleus, organelles, and no hemoglobin. Leukocytes are classified as either granular, which means they contain vesicles that appear when the cells are stained, or agranular, which means they contain no granules. Granular leukocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, and agranular leukocytes are lymphocytes and monocytes. So looking at figure 19.7 on page 708, we see that the shapes of the nuclei, the staining property, properties of their cytoplasmic granules, help to distinguish the different types of white blood cells from one another. White blood cells may live their life for several months or years, and their main function is to combat invading microbes. So during an invasion of microbes, many white blood cells are able to leave the bloodstream and collect at the sites of the invasion. This process is called e-migration. So this cartoon is on page 709, and it's figure 19.8. And this is just an, a, a cartoon or a dramatization of the e-migration of white blood cells. For example, adhesion molecules assist in the emigration of white blood cells from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid. So you can see the process there. We've got this neutrophil and this endothelial cell, and then the emigration part begins where the cell is going to do some rolling and then some sticking, and then it'll squeeze between the endothelial cells. So neutrophils are the most abundant of the white blood cells, and they constitute about 60 to 70 percent of the circulating leukocytes. They will defend against the bacterial or fungal infection. 
They're usually the first responders to a microbial infection, and their activity and death in large numbers forms what we call pus. Neutrophils are active in phagos phagocytosing bacteria and are present in large amounts in the pus of the wounds. These cells will die after they have phagocytized, phagocytized a few pathogens. Neutrophils are the most common cell type seen in the early stages of acute inflammation. The lifespan of a circulating human neutrophil is about 5.4 days. Eosinophils compose about 2 to 4 percent of the total white blood cell count. This count fluctuates throughout the day, seasonally, and during menstruation. It rises in response to allergies, parasitic infections, collagen diseases, and diseases of the spleen and the central nervous system. The eosinophil primary, primarily deals with parasitic infections. Eosinophils are also the predominant inflammatory cells in allergic reactions. The most important causes of eosinophilia include allergies such as asthma, hay fever, and hives, and also parasitic infection. They secrete chemicals that destroy these large parasites such as hookworms and tapeworms that are too big for any one white blood cell to phagocytize. Basophils are chiefly responsible for allergic and antigen response by releasing the chemical histamine causing the dilation of blood vessels. They excrete two chemicals that aid in the body's defenses, and that's histamine and heparin. Histamine is responsible for widening blood vessels and increasing the flow of blood to injured tissue. It also makes blood vessels more permeable, so neutrophils and clotting proteins can get into the connective tissue more easily. Heparin, on the other hand, is an anticoagulant that inhibits blood clotting and promotes the movement of white blood cells into an area. Basophils can also release chemical signals that attract eosinophils and neutrophils to an infection site. Lymphocytes are much more common in the lymphatic system than in the blood. Lymphocytes include the B cells, and the B cells make antibodies that combine to pathogens, block pathogen invasion, activate the complement system, and enhance pathogen destruction. Another type of lymphocyte is the T cell, and we know those as the CD4 and helper T cells. T cells displaying co the co-receptor CD4 are known as CD4 plus T cells. The CD8 plus cytotoxic T cells is another type of T cell, and natural killer cells are also classified as T cells. Monocytes are the largest type of the white blood cells, and they share a quote-unquote vacuum cleaner phagocytosis function of neutrophils, but are much longer lived as they have an extra role. They present pieces of pathogens to T cells so that the pathogens may be recognized again and killed. This causes an antibody response to be mounted. Monocytes eventually leave the bloodstream and become tissue macrophages, which remove dead cell debris as well as attacking microorganisms. Neither dead cell debris nor attacking microorganisms can be dealt with effectively by the neutrophils. Unlike neutrophils, Monocytes are able to replace their lysosomal content and are thought to have a much longer active life. They have the kidney, excuse me, they have a kidney-shaped nucleus and are typically agranulated. They also possess abundant cytoplasm. In general, an elevation in white blood cell count usually indicates an infection or inflammation. A low white blood cell count, on the other hand, may develop due to several causes. Some of those causes may be things like cancer treatment, certain medicines, some cancers, and infections such as HIV. A differential white blood cell count will help determine if a problem exists. This is table 19.2 on page 19. And this just goes through different types of white blood cells and what a high count may indicate and what a low count may indicate. So again, I'll let you study this table on your own time. And remember, I like to pull quiz and exam questions from tables and figures, too. Platelets begin on page 710 of your book. Thrombocytes are colorless blood cells that help blood to clot. Platelets stop bleeding by clumping and forming plugs in the blood vessel injury. 
Thrombocytopenia often occurs as a result of leukemia or an immune system problem. So as I said on the previous slide, platelets are used to clot the blood. Under the influence of hor the hormone thrombopoietin, hem hemopoietin stem cells differentiate into platelets. Megakaryocytes in red bone marrow splinter into 2,000 to 3,000 fragments to create the platelets that contain many vesicles but no nucleus. Platelets can survive for about five to nine days. Platelets are a component of blood whose function, along with coagulation, is to stop bleeding by clumping and clotting blood vessel injuries. Platelets have no cell nucleus. They are fragments of cytoplasm that are derived from the megakaryocytes of the bone marrow. And then inner circulation. These unactivated platelets are a bioconvex discoid. In other words, they're lens-shaped structures, 2 to 3 micrometers in their greatest diameter. The main function of platelets is to contribute to hemostasis. Hemostasis is the process of stopping bleeding at the site of interrupted endothelium. The platelets will gather at the site of interruption, and unless the interruption is physically too large, they will plug the hole. So what happens is, first, platelets attach to substances outside the interrupted endothelium. This is called adhesion. Then they change shape, turn on receptors, and secrete chemical messengers. This step is called activation. And the third step, which we call aggregation, is where they connect to each other through receptor bridges. So table 19.3 begins on page 711 and goes until page 712. And in this table, it summarizes the formed elements in the blood. So you can see it has the name and appearance. So we see the name and we see a little cartoon of each various formed element. The number of these formed elements, their characteristics and their functions. And I'd like for you to study this table on your own time. And this slide is just a continuation of table 19.3. Stem cell transplants from bone marrow and cord blood. Bone marrow transplants are performed to replace cancerous red bone marrow with normal red bone marrow. The donor's marrow is usually collected from the iliac crest of the hip bone. Stem cells collected from an umbilical cord after birth can be frozen and may also be used and have advantages over bone marrow transplants. Some parents will do this for their children after birth. Uh, the idea is that if the stem cells are frozen and then when the child gets older and if they have a medical problem, that these stem cells can be harvested and maybe help to improve the health or to heal uh, their child in their adulthood or their later life. Hemostasis means to stop bleeding. This process involves vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, and blood clotting or coagulation. So this is figure... 19.9 on page 714, and this is a step-by-step -step process of hemostasis. So first we see that there's some collagen fibers and some damaged endothelium, and then we see the platelets. Uh, they start to kind of group in that area, and that's called platelet adhesion. Secondly, we have the platelet release reaction, so you can see the liberated ADP serotonin and thromboxane A2, and you can see that the platelets are changing shape. And then we get this third step that we call platelet aggregation, where the platelets begin to form a plug, and this is going to help to prevent bleeding. So figure 19.10 on page 714. So we can see that the uh, hemostasis in detail of a scanning electron microscope. So we see the red blood cells and the platelets in the early stage A. And then um, during the platelet release 
reaction. Uh, that would be the intermediate stage there at uh, 900 times. And then finally, uh, letter C, where we have the late stage, where it shows the red blood cells trapped in the fibrin threads. So this is the uh, process of blood clotting. Hemostasis, or blood clotting, involves several clotting factors identified by Roman numerals and divided into three stages. The three stages are the extrinsic pathway, the intrinsic pathway, and the common pathway. And this cartoon is on page 715, figure 19.11. And this shows in blood clotting, coagulation factors are activated in sequence, and this results in a cascade of reactions that includes positive feedback cycles. And table 19.4 on page 716 is a table of clotting factors. And you can go through this table on your own time. In hemostasis, once the clot forms, it consolidates to pull the edges of the damaged vessel together. Then vitamin K is needed for normal clot formation, although it is not directly involved. It is used in the synthesis of four clotting factors. Small, unwanted clots are usually dissolved by plasmin. Blood typing is a method to tell what specific type of blood you have. What type you have depends on whether or not there are certain proteins called antigens on your red blood cells. Blood is often grouped according to the ABO blood typing system. So blood is characterized into different blood groups based on the presence or absence of glycoprotein and glycolipid antigens on the surface of the red blood cells. There are 24 blood groups and more than 100 antigens. Because these antigens are generally controlled, blood types vary among different populations. Classification is based on antigens labeled A, B, or AB, and the letter O means that the blood is absent of these antigens. An additional antigen, RH, is present in 85% of humans. So the RH factor is generally if you heard the term uh, a person is A positive, B positive, O positive. That means that there's this RH factor present on the blood. So O negative, there's no RH factor. O positive, there's an RH factor. So as we were just talking about on the previous slide, blood typing is also done to tell whether or not you have a substance called an RH factor on the surface of your red blood cells. If you have this substance, you are considered RH positive, and if you do not have this substance, you're considered RH negative. RH typing uses a method similar to ABO typing. So this table 19.5 is on page 718, and this just kind of goes through the different blood types in the United States based on race. So it's important that healthcare providers know your blood type because not all blood types are compatible with other blood types. So if you needed to get a transplant or a transfusion, not all types of tissue are compatible from person to person. For example, if you have type A blood, you can only receive types A and type O blood. If you have B blood, you can only receive types B and type O blood. If you have type AB blood, you can receive types A, B, AB, and O blood, and that's called the universal acceptor. And if you have type O blood, you can only receive type O blood, and that's called the universal donor. So that's why I just said type O blood can be given to anyone with any blood type. That is why people with type O blood are called the universal donor. Furthermore, we can extrapolate this slide to the RH factor. For instance, a person with type A positive blood can receive a donation from a person with A negative blood. However, a person with A negative blood cannot receive the blood from a person with A positive. And that holds true for the whole uh, slide here, all the different blood types and all the different donations. Um, 
only people with the positive uh, group can uh, receive uh, both positive and negative blood types, and only people with the negative blood type can receive uh, other negative blood types that are compatible with their blood. So here we have figure 19.14 on page 720, and this just goes through the various blood groups and their blood types and how their antigens may appear. And table 19.6, also on page 720, it just shows a summary of the ABO blood group interactions, and we were talking about this a couple slides ago. And like I said, we can extrapolate this out to the RH factor too, uh, but I'd like for you to study this table on your own time. In order to determine a person's blood type, typing and cross-matching are performed. A drop of blood is mixed with an antiserum that will agglutinate blood cells that possess agglutinogens that react with it. So this is figure 19.16 on page 721. And we can see in the procedure for ABO blood typing, blood is mixed with antiserum A and antiserum B. Blood typing is especially important during pregnancy. If the mother is found to be RH negative, the father should also be tested. If the father is RH positive, the mother needs to receive a treatment to help prevent the development of substances that may harm the unborn baby. If you are RH positive, you can receive RH positive or RH negative blood. And if you are RH negative, you can only receive RH negative blood. And I said this on a previous slide. Going on to the next slide, hemolytic disease of the newborn. At birth, small amounts of fetal blood leak into the maternal circulation. If the baby is Rh positive and the mother is Rh negative, she will develop antibodies to the Rh factor. During her next pregnancy with an Rh positive baby, when she transfers antibodies to the fetus, transferred anti-Rh antibodies will attack some of the fetus's red blood cells causing agglutination and hemolysis. So this figure is 19.15 on page 721. It shows that hemolytic disease of the newborn occurs when the maternal anti-RH antibodies cross the placenta and cause hemolysis of the fetal red blood cells. So at letter A, at birth, a small quantity of fetal blood usually leaks across the placenta into the maternal bloodstream. A problem can arise when the mother is Rh negative and the baby is Rh positive, having inherited an allele for the Rh antigens from the father. At letter B, on exposure to the Rh antigen, the mother's immune system responds by making anti-Rh antibodies. And at letter C, during a subsequent pregnancy, the maternal antibodies cross the placenta into the fetal blood. If the second fetus is Rh positive, the ensuing antigen antibody reaction causes agglutination and hemolysis of the fetal R red blood cells and this results in the hemolytic disease of the newborn. Disorders and homeostatic imbalances. Sickle cell disease is a genetic anemia. The red blood cells of individuals with this disease contain hemoglobin S that causes red blood cells to bend into a sickle shape when it gives up oxygen to the interstitial fluid. And this slide is a variation of figure 19.17 on page 723. But you can see the beginning of sickle cell, a crenated, a normal red blood cell, and then a sickled red blood cell. So let's talk about more hemolog hematological disorders. Anemia is an insufficient red blood cell mass that can be the result of bleeding, blood disorders like thalassemia, or nutritional deficiencies. This may require a blood transfusion. And we were just talking about sickle cell anemia, but that's another type of hematological disorder of the blood. Leukemia is another hematological disorder of the blood, and this is a group of cancers of the blood forming tissues and cells. Non-cancerous overproduction of red blood cells, polycythemia, uh, may be pre-malignant. Also, uh, the overproduction of platelets may also be an indication of something that's pre-malignant. 
myelodysplastic syndromes involve the in ineffective production of one or more cell lines. Disorders of coagulation can also occur. Hemophilia is an example of this. Hemophilia is a genetic illness that causes a dysfunction in one or more of the blood's clotting mechanisms. This can allow otherwise inconsequential wounds to be life-threatening, but more commonly this results in hemarthrosis or bleeding into the joint spaces, which can be crippling. Ineffective or insufficient platelets can also result in coagulopathy or a bleeding disorder. And then hypercoagulable state or thrombophilia results from defects in the regulation of platelet or clotting factor function, and this can cause thrombosis. So blood is an important vector of infection. What I mean by vector of infection is that the blood can carry a disease and transmit it to another person. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is transmitted through contact with the blood, semen, or other body secretions of an infected person. Hepatitis B and C are primarily transmitted through blood contact. So blood-borne infections, blood-stained objects, they are all treated as a biohazard. Bacterial infection of the blood is called bacteremia or sepsis. A viral infection of the blood is called viremia. And there are also bloodborne parasitic infections such as malaria and trypanomasis. Carbon monoxide poisoning is also another infectious disorder of the blood. So substances other than oxygen can bind to hemoglobin. In some cases, this can cause irreversible damage to the body. Carbon monoxide, for example, is extremely dangerous when carried to the blood via the lungs by inhalation because carbon monoxide irreversibly binds to hemoglobin to form carboxyhemoglobin, so less hemoglobin is free to bind oxygen, and therefore fewer oxygen mo molecules can be transported throughout the blood. This can cause suffocation insidiously. Also, a fire burning in an enclosed room with poor ventilation presents a very dangerous hazard since it can create a buildup of carbon monoxide in the air. Also, it should be noted that some carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin when smoking tobacco. Leukemia is a group of cancers that usually begin in the bone marrow and result in high numbers of abnormal white blood cells. These white blood cells are not fully developed and are called blasts or leukemia cells. Symptoms may include bleeding and bruising problems, feeling tired, fever, and an increased risk of infections. These symptoms occur due to a lack of normal blood cells. Diagnosis is typically made by blood tests or bone marrow biopsy. Moving on to the next slide. There are four main types of leukemia. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and chronic myeloid leukemia. Leukemias and lymphomas be both belong to a broader group of tumors that affect the blood and bone marrow and lymphoid system, known as tumors of the hematopoietic and lymphoid tissues. And that concludes this evening's lecture. Thank you.